This podcast is brought to you in association with HelloFresh. HelloFresh deliver all the fresh, quality ingredients and easy-to-follow recipes from a changing weekly menu for you to cook great-tasting dinners from scratch at home. No planning, no shopping, just everything you need to put the delicious back into dinner time. Welcome to another episode of Happy Mum, Happy Baby, the podcast. Today I have not one, but two guests. And I'm really thrilled because I love them together. They are Pixie Woo, they are sisters, they are Sam and Nick. Hi. Hi. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Not at all. Thanks for coming on. Our pleasure. I could have done one, you know, either, but two together. There might be an argument. There could be. <laughs> you never know. But also I think it's that sibling thing of going through and having kids... Like having both had kids, and, and and for me, having kids has brought me much closer to my brother and my sister. Oh, definitely. Nick and I didn't get on before I had kids. So my my eldest daughter is nearly 14 now, and that's when we started getting on, isn't it? It is, yeah, because you needed me. Really? Yeah, absolutely. We couldn't even be in the same county, Yeah. <laughs> let alone the same room. And now and now we get on really well because we both have kids. Lily what was it about together. having kids, or having Lily then, that do you think brought you together? Um, I really needed help. Yeah. She you know, I was desperate. That's the truth. Really? I was desperate. Anyone, like, anyone, just anyone, please. But there's that for me. Like with Mario and Georgie, I feel like everyone else, especially first time, I wanted them to think that I was amazing, that I was super mum. And then whenever they came over, I'd be like, Ah, what am I doing? <laughs> exactly that. I was so broken. I thought it would be really easy. And then you get this baby and you're like, I don't know how to bath you. I don't know how many blankets to put on you. I have no clue. And I remember I probably stayed at home. I was living in London. I stayed at home for about a week. And then I just legged it to my mum's in Norfolk and was like, mum, just help me. <laughs> Please just help me. Um, and I couldn't have done any of it without her, to be honest. Really? Or Nick. Yeah. So supportive. And yeah, when you had Ollie... I took time off work to come and be with her for a couple of weeks because she already had Lily and it's just difficult. Yeah. Just need someone so you can have a little sleep or a little rest or just to do the washing, just to cook the dinner. It's those simple things, but I think it, when it's a sibling that does it, it doesn't feel like it's a massive thing that someone's doing it for you. Totally. Because you can be mean to them. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You can say, no, 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 don't do it like that. And also you can show your vulnerability, yeah. Yeah. which you probably find more difficult with other people because you're like, I just want to come across like I know what I'm doing. Mm. But um, no I didn't does. I didn't have a clue. I mean, I was 20, was I 26? I think I was just 27 when I had Lily. And that was pretty young. You know, I mean, my mum had me at 20, but it was a different time yeah. then. And, but being in London... That was quite young for all my friends. Still, mm -hmm. a lot of my friends haven't had kids and we're in our 40s now. Yeah. Um, so it was really quite a shock because I'd gone into like from being this single person that didn't have to think about anything to mm. being a parent. Right. And I had to do all that stuff. And still all my mates were very free and very single and living their lives. And it was just, yeah, hard, really, really hard. Were you single when you had Lily? No, or? I wasn't. I was with the dad, with her dad. Um, we still got on really well. Yeah. But um, it certainly wasn't easy because I was a freelance makeup artist. So how do you sort out childcare when you mm -hmm. don't know what days are going to work? It was really incredibly hard. And as you know, childcare is really expensive. Mm -hmm. So I would just, um, I found, uh, I actually got a child minder because it was the cheapest way I could. And I would just book, book Lily in for like three days and then try and arrange work around it. It was really hard. Yeah. What was the hardest thing about having, having Lily? Um, I think if I'm really, really honest, the hardest thing was losing my identity because mm. I wasn't. No, what? You cut all your hair off, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I did. Did you? Yeah, I did that. I did that <laughs> fatal error of like. How much hair are we talking? I'm talking. I had really long hair. <laughs> now, when I when I got pregnant with Lily, I I thought brilliant this is a great chance to eat as much cheesecake as I want so I ate cheesecake back to back <laughs> like solidly so I was about I, I put on a lot of weight not not a small amount and Jim and John started calling me Sam Zilla like I was enormous That's and then supportive. of course yeah brilliant so then when I had Lily I was still a fair size mm. but I felt like I'd lost my identity so what what's the first thing you do you get a haircut so I had this awful short crop so I was just really Proper enormous sure. with, with short hair. Yeah, it was the, probably the worst thing I could have done. Right. But I'm really glad I did it. Do you know what I mean? It's like yeah. a funny story. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Nick? I dyed my hair blonde. 
Oh, did you? Straight after having Harry, I think, because I couldn't do anything to my hair. So I was like, I need something. I need to not be just the mum. Yeah. I need my identity back. So I um, bleached all my hair. <laughs> I do. I do. Was it hard seeing Sam at that vulnerable stage of having had Lily? I don't think it was hard because I've always seen that side of my sister. Mm. So it was just like, okay, this is not a time to joke. This is a time to step up and help. Yeah. Whereas quite often we would, you know, we all quite have banter with each other and, and wind each other up. I was like, okay, she actually needs my help. Yeah. So I actually have to be the sister that's like, don't worry, I got it. You carry on. You bond, I'll do this. Do you know it what I mean? T- it took me an incredible amount of time to bond with Lily. Mm. In fact, I mean, I, d- I don't know if it didn't take me months and months and months. Really? Yeah, I had quite a traumatic birth and it was just hard to connect afterwards. I was the same with Harry. Um, but, you know, I mean, I absolutely love, love, love my kids now. Of course. You always feel like you have to add that in, yeah, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, Because it's obvious but you love you your kids. you know what? That's but... come up time and time again, yeah. this bond thing. And I think because there is such a big expectation, we're all told, oh, that moment where you meet your baby, you're just flooded totally. with love and it's the most amazing thing ever. Your life has changed and it has changed. But for me as well, I was like, I don't know. Yeah. I've just, I've just met him. What is Absolutely. going on? Absolutely. Yeah. You know? I didn't feel that connection. When I, when I first saw my baby, I was like, oh my God, it's... It's here. What do I do? Mm-hmm. Um, it was more fear than anything. But I, it took me a really long time to go, oh, yeah, I get it. I felt like I had to learn to love. Really? Do you know what I mean? I, yeah. I was given Harry and I was like, cool. Does someone else want to hold him? <laughs> like, what do I do? Yeah. But I even remember waking up in the night um, and breastfeeding, which he couldn't even latch on. I have big boobs anyway. Mm. You'd think, God, they, they're made for this job. <laughs> No, they could. They didn't work at all. And I'd get up in the night with him and he'd latch on, which is so painful when they Mm. first do it. And I was like, oh, God. And I thought, I'm just feeding this child that I... He's just waking me up and I don't feel anything. Mm -hmm. I feel nothing. I'm just going through the motions. And then I stopped breastfeeding. Really? I stopped breastfeeding and instantly that stopped. I loved him. It was the weirdest thing. And I did the same with my daughter and I stopped breastfeeding. I, it was like every time they latched on, I felt an overwhelming depression. And people, you know, I thought, oh, this is something natural. It should. And my daughter was really quick to latch on. She was fine. But it made me boil inside. I felt so depressed every single time that my even my husband said to me, I think you need to stop mm. breastfeeding. Like there's no, you know, you're not going to win an award for it don't have to do it stop yeah and I did and that was fine and I I don't think people talk about that very often because we're always told oh this bond that comes with feeding like they look at you no they don't they've got their eyes shut most of the time they're looking at the boob yeah (laughs) it's it's exactly that and I think you know for, for us when any of our friends get pregnant the first time or whatever we say here's a few extra things if you feel this don't you know you might not but mm. if you feel like it's kind of hard to bond that's perfectly normal yep. if you feel like this it's perfectly normal you know and we we kind of we don't scare them obviously mm. but i think it's also really important to say it's not all this perfect because i had no idea when i had my kid i just felt like an absolute failure i was like no one feels like this i just don't like my child but but that's normal. why I started sharing online. That's mm. why I ended up, up I ended up writing the book and why this podcast has come about. Because I do think there's that whole, especially when Instagram first started, and there's this whole, this is a perfect. perfect family, guys. And actually, anything that deviates from that, you do feel like a failure. Totally. You feel like you're being judged. You feel like you're getting it wrong. And and it's so overwhelming. And you, it just, you get into a spiral then. And you can't get out of it. Totally. No one told me that Ian and I would argue like crazy when we brought the baby home, when we brought Harry home. No one warned me. And maybe it doesn't doesn't ha- didn't happen for everyone, but every single thing. Obviously, I had so many hormones going mm. on. We hadn't slept much. We argued so much, and everything I did with Harry, I had to run past someone else. Well, this is interesting because I watched a video of you talking about baby yeah. blues, and I've n- honestly never heard anyone talk about it where uh, about a, a relationship and how this child belongs to both of you, and you have to run it by the other person what you're doing. But also, the, what that does is it kind of makes you go. Is this the right decision? I was running everything past Tom. Anyone actually, any other parent that was in there, you know, I was like, I don't understand these cries. Do you know what these cries mean? Not to Tom, to his friends, like, totally. who have kids and stuff. And I'm just so much self-doubt. Yeah, you you question everything. 
And I think never have I owned something equally with someone, mm. ever. You know, you can have a car, you can have... doesn't matter. When it's a person and they put in just as much effort, you have to run everything past them. And that's one thing that I found really hard. Yeah. Being an independent woman, I found that hard. It's like, oh, you know, do you want these sorts of nappies or do you think these ones? That I found hard because I'd just go, well, I'm going this. Yeah. But having to think about someone else's opinion in such an important thing mm -hmm. is, a, is a whole new challenge. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Um, yeah, because I sometimes wondered whether I was doing it too much. Yeah. But I guess it's just each, each couple or each like, family's different. Totally. What works for you might not work for others. And I think that's the thing, especially when, you, when you've had a child and you've been through it, you want to tell your story. Everyone's story is different. Yeah. And everyone's story is just as important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something that was brilliant for you may not be. And we should never try and say, you need to do it this yeah. way. This is the right this way. This is the way. Yeah. No, that's your way. Don't you think, though, part of that is because people go through so much so they feel, like, quite defensive over what they've decided to do. So they feel like that's got to be the right way. So then they try and push it on other people. Totally. There's just so many opinions, isn't there? Yeah. Everyone has an opinion on something. And it's just, you know, really, it's just easier to to keep it to yourself. With my kids, I've almost let them... I mean, obviously, I'm their parent and I do discipline them, but I almost have let them um, bring... Not bring themselves up, but, like, from a young age, Olivia has always chosen what she wore, hasn't mm. she? Yeah. Like, if she wanted to wear 15 pairs of pants, she could wear them. Mm. If she wanted to put a skirt on that didn't match her top, doesn't matter yeah. because she's not my trophy. Yeah. I just want her to to learn, you know, to, to learn to be independent and to learn to express herself creatively, mm -hmm. whatever that might be. So in a lot of ways, I've done that with both my kids, just, just kind of let them be their own people and, and sort of taken their lead with who they are as to how I then parent them because they're yeah. so different. Yeah. I can't do the same job on both of them. They're completely <laughs> the opposite. And you find that a lot when you have two yeah. because... The, the eldest one will carve their own path and then the second one will come along and they'll have to find their own path that doesn't fit, that doesn't kind of Cross sit over. in the same place as the eldest one. Because mm. so otherwise the, you're always in competition. Yeah, they tend to be the opposite. Like I, I was always really good at art and Nick was then really, really good at sport and sport was her thing and that worked well for us mm. because we just do the opposite. Yeah. My kids are exactly the same. What are yours like? Are they like that too? So different. Yeah. So different. Buzz is our sort of emotional showman. Yeah. And uh, and Buddy is the wildlife explorer, they, adventurer. They yeah. find their way. It's mm. so funny because, you know, we all have to fit into this pack that we've been born into. Otherwise, you if you're not good at it, you get left behind. Do you know what I mean? Well, it's also way? that girl boy thing as well. Yeah, because we've got it at the moment. Because Buddy's going around with pink nail varnish on his toes. Oh, so <laughs> because him. I was doing mine, and he was yeah. like me, me, and he's so headstrong, Buddy. You're just like, well, if that, that's absolutely fine. Of course. And Tom posted it, and there was a, obviously a backlash. Oh. At one, it was nail varnish. Two, it was pink. Harry I mean, always <laughs> chooses. If Edie's having her nails painted because she's a real princess, Harry's like, can I have some? Also, who decided pink was a cut was a girl's colour? Actually, you used to be a boy's colour. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it used to be a boy's colour. It's yeah. just a colour. All just colours a color. are just colours. And what, what are we scared of? Absolutely. What are we actually scared of? I agree. It's well, we actually. I went on holiday with my um, husband's family, and his niece, or our niece, um, was questioning the kids at the dinner table, and she was like, "She's a bit older, so mm. she thinks she's she's in charge." And she was like, "Harry, do you think boys can marry boys?" He's like, "Of course." Do you think boys can love boys? He's like, of course, of course they can. I love daddy. You know how, because oh, he's yeah, six. Yeah. He's, he's like innocent. Do you think that boys can wear nail varnish? He's like, yeah, I wear it. And I was inside, I was like, oh my God, I'm so proud yeah. that he is like, yeah. And he said it was such confidence because to him, what difference does it make? Mm. And I love that. I think, well, you know, and she said to me afterwards, I think you brought him up well. I was like, that, How old is she? She's uh, twelve. Oh. That's amazing. I was like, oh, oh, thanks, thanks for letting me know that. That's, that means a lot. But I was inside. I was like oh, the proudest mum ever yeah. that he doesn't have an opinion on that. Mm. He thinks that everyone is the same. Oh no, she also said, um, "Who earns the money?" He went, "Mum and Dad." And I was like, "Good boy," yeah. because for so long it's always been Dad goes out to work. Yeah. I loved it. I was like, oh, my God. It, it's, you know, the little things you do do make them, they notice. Yeah. 
I, I also have that feeling at the moment about, um, so when we're doing interviews and stuff, if I get asked, so what's Tom like as a dad? Is he really hands-on? I'm like, but if Tom was in an interview and you asked that about me... Wow. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be insulting? We Absolutely. get asked it all the time. Who has the kids when you're away? <clears throat> you know what? They do have a dad. They, you know, no one would ever ask yeah. that of, if Ian was in an interview, who's got your kids? Yeah. Never going to happen. It's but weird. I think for women, so much pressure has been put on to, to be the mum, to be now have a career, to do all of those things, to so pack more in, but, you know, add in loads of guilt with that as well. Yes, Absolutely. You know, just so you can't ever feel satisfied. And then you've got to or... bounce straight back. Oh, yeah, 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 bounce back. You, yeah, you back. feel guilty about everything, don't you? Yeah. You know, like, well, we work away a lot and there's something to do with being a blogger where people don't feel like you should earn money from doing this thing that mm. you do, but you're also like, who would work this hard and spend essentially about four months of the year away from their kids without earning a really good amount of money no one would choose to do that no. obviously we earn money we wouldn't do it otherwise mm. and providing yeah. for your family means very absolutely different things for, for everyone it does completely but you know when you're away you feel guilty that you're not being the best parent mm. you know when you're with your kids you know that you've got emails to answer so yeah. you're like oh my god I'm still not being the best parent I'm not I'm thinking about this other thing when you're when you're doing your emails you've got kids running around yeah. you know so you're all the time you're guilt. there at home you're doing the washing or totally. like doing the washing up or whatever else there's constant guilt and actually you know one of the most liberating things for me obviously I'm in a really fortunate position now because I work hard and I and I obviously earn decent money from it is that I can afford to pay for somebody to help me mm. so I have a nanny that works three days a week which has actually changed my life completely because it stopped me feeling so guilty I used to feel because me and me and the kids dad aren't together anymore mm -hmm. um I used to feel very guilty about saying Danny can you have the kids on such and such a night because I felt that he would judge me that I was away for these at this amount of time you right. know and now I have this nanny it's almost like a buffer so I can just say right you know can you just do those days mm. and it's brilliant it's it's really really changed things also she helps with washing she does i mean this is my best thing she orders all my shopping does she yeah i need that but <laughs> i think that a lot of people might feel and i certainly felt that doing that and getting help would be a cop out mm. but i can't do everything well i was yeah. talking to a female friend the other day and she said i feel guilty or stupid every time i say i've got a nanny absolutely she's like but i can't physically do what i do unless i have that person there. i feel so lucky that I can be in the situation to have somebody to help me. Mm. It's amazing. I think the good thing about working with your sister is that we reassure each other that we're all right. Yeah. Yeah. We're doing the right thing. You know, we. I got a nanny first, actually, because I have MS. I was like, I need help. And my kids are my trigger quite often when they argue a lot and I can't get everything done, so I got help. And I said to Sam... Also, mm -hmm. even if you didn't have MS, now, yeah. you don't have to make that... You no. Know, that is, do you see what I mean? But it's I just one of those things that mm. you automatically apologise for doing it. It's totally fine. But no, I still have her. What yeah. I mean is I have MS and I still have her when I'm at home mm. because I just need to step away from it sometimes. Mm. And I said to Sam, you're trying to do everything and you're not doing anything well. Mm-hmm because you're constantly feeling the guilt. I was like, don't worry about it. You know, get some help. Don't feel bad about it. We, you know, people can't do it all on their own. Well, and also there's that whole it takes a village to raise a child thing, you know. Yeah. yeah. We all we all now, you know, loads of people go to uni, they move away from home, you know, so you don't have that support network around you like we would have done maybe 50 years ago. Absolutely. And I think as well, you know, being somebody that, that is quite controlling of, my career and because I've always worked for myself you know having to accept that I couldn't do it all mm. and ask for help or pay for help or whatever what felt like a failure but I need it I absolutely need it and it to the point where I nearly had a nervous breakdown last year just from trying to do too much you yeah. can't and at some point you're like right I've got to stop well when it comes to like maternal mental health yeah. that's a massive part of yeah. all that pressure that we put on ourselves absolutely I mean you had quite a bit of yeah I had a uh... It's not, it wasn't depression or I had baby blues. Mm. After I had Harry, I was really, really down. And um, so I did a video about it because I had to own it. Yeah. I knew something was going on. I knew I wasn't bonding. I knew Ian and I were arguing a lot. I knew I wasn't feeling the way I should. And then when I snapped out of it, you know, and it took a long time, when I finally came around, I was like, I need to tell other people that this happens because they're the things that are going to help people. Mm -hmm. You know, just the little 
it's, it doesn't always, you know, you don't instantly love those sorts of things that you can feel sad, but be completely happy at the mm -hmm. same time. But the other thing is saying, saying I didn't feel the way that I think I should is is exactly our programming. Yeah. How yeah. should you feel? Yeah. yeah. How should you feel? Because you're told that you should feel that way, but how many people actually do feel mm -hmm. that way? Because I didn't, you didn't, loads of people that we've discussed it with didn't. Yeah. So is everyone m doing that? Because you know after you've had a baby, they say, right, you've got a few visits from your midwife, they're going to come to your house, and you're like, okay, tidy, yeah. tidy. Yeah. Right, how, what should we wear? Should we make sure we look like we've got it under control? Because really, I don't have it under control. And you, everything is trying to put because on Because we think that they're going to take our baby away. Exactly. Straight away. And actually, the health professionals that come and visit, they're on your side. Yeah. They're she, totally on your side. She was like, how I did are not you feeling? <laughs> how are you feeling? And I'm yeah. like, really, really good. Love him like mad. You know, oh, Harry. Inside, I was thinking, oh, jeez. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Am I holding him right? Do you know what I mean? You just put on a... Do you think part of it as well is because we're always so focused on the labour? I don't think I, I really saw beyond that. I think so, but I also think that we shouldn't underestimate the fact that we're British. And so <laughs> being British does come with this kind of like repression of, you know, stiff upper lip and we can't show that our weaknesses and we can't yeah. ask for help. I mean, lots of other European, when you meet a lot of other Europeans, you notice how different mm. they their culture is and how differently they they deal with these kind of things. I put a lot of things down to being British. Really? Yeah. I do. didn't even think about labour the whole time. Because really? Because I had such a lovely pregnancy. Yeah. Was just and I was like, oh my god, I'm just that person that's going to have a lovely labour. And then I had labour, and then I was like, ooh. It's interesting that you both had quite difficult births to start with. Well, my first one was a was uh, obviously a long labour and then an emergency caesarean. Right. So for the second one, I just did the elective. Right. Because I said, look, you know, can they want you to have, you know, a, a normal birth? And I said, well, look, if you can guarantee me that it will just be a normal birth, that's fine. But I don't want to do both again because mm. both really knackered me out. And they said, well, we can't really guarantee that. And then I said, right, well, just elective. Mm. Um, we both yeah. had back-to-back -back as well, labour. So oh, really? yeah. um, Harry was back-to-back -back and his head was wonky. And uh, I had 55-hour labour. And then they were like, OK, maybe we need to actually get this baby out. So I had an episiotomy. They hurt. I was talking to... So I I um, had an episiotomy first time around, tore the second, tearing is so much nicer. Is really? It? Because... And I was, I've been talking to different people about it because your skin naturally... Obviously, they stitch it, but it, it knits back together. Whereas if it's a, a, a slice... If it's sliced yeah. and it's a clean cut then that's really difficult to stitch back together and for it to knit. That's quite interesting. It's really interesting. I, I split, even though I had an emergency caesarean. Um, they were obviously trying with the Von Tues and mm. all of that other stuff mm. to get her out that way. Um, and I split, so I got stitches down there and a caesarean. But I didn't notice the stitches down there yeah. at all. And I didn't notice that I'd split. I had no mm -hmm. idea. I think I would have noticed if I'd had an episiotomy. Oh, my God. Honestly, it was the worst thing. I th so first time around, I had an obstetrician. Second time around, I, did, I went midwife-led. Yeah. And obstetricians, for me, they, they, they see labour as, a, as, a, as an issue, as a problem, something to work around. Okay. <laughs> Whereas with the midwife, they kind of like trust exactly your body. what happened with me. Really? Yeah, I had um, the doctor came in at the end and I was doing the labour so well and then... This is so weird, and, and I'm sure this doesn't happen all the time, but um, I heard her say, I have to get a flight, a doctor. I have to get a flight. And the midwives were going, no, she's only got a couple more pushes and she's out. She said, no, I'm, I'm doing an episiotomy. And Ian heard it as well, and she cut me. And all the midwives were like, no, no, and we saw them doing it. And um, then I had an episiotomy, and... Oh, it was just, it took me so long yeah. to get back. And every time I, won, that's probably why I didn't bond as well with Harry because mm. I was so scared of everything. You know, having a bath, sliding yourself into the bath, not yeah, being able to sit down. Mm. I cried every time yeah. I needed a number two. Mm -hmm. Every time I would cry my eyes out. And I was so constipated because of it. And I said to Ian, I can't, I, I'm so scared to go. I'm so scared to go crying whilst he's holding my hand while I'm trying to go to the Aww. toilet. And in the end, I got baby wipes and I pushed them against the scar. Yeah, that's what I did. How yeah. funny. Hold it, those, hold yeah, it to so hold it not, into place yeah. so that I could go to the oh, toilet. Oh, my yeah. goodness. It was, you know. But it helps. It helped so much. Yeah. And it's forgotten. It's forgotten now. And 
I would do anything to get my baby out. But it was just then when I, with my second labour, I was so panicked about my first labour that I um, went and said to them, I'm, I'm so terrified. I would really like a elective C-section if I could. And they were like, we'll see, we'll see. And they did all the scaremongering, as they have to. Mm. And um, then they went away and they said, came back and they said, no, we're not going to give you one because we think you could have a perfect normal labour. And I'd been to see someone uh, to check whether I could and he said, you've got a, a really high chance of prolapsing because right. of it. And I, and I had all this paperwork all documented and I said, um, well, I'm going to take this further. So they said, OK, come back tomorrow and we'll give you a doctor. It was the doctor, the doctor that cut oh, me no. initially that came through. And I'm instantly like, oh, my God, I really dislike you. I really. And, he, and then she, she said, no, we're not going to allow you to have one. And I said, OK, I have this paperwork. If anything goes wrong, I'm suing you. Because I had to fight for myself. And she said, OK, OK, don't be like that. We'll let you have one. I had to fight. I think that's now crazy, isn't it? They're Fighting much nicer. For, the, for the birth and the labour that you want when it's your body. Yeah, I think they're much more. Um, it's it's probably easier to get a C-section now, but at the time I, when I was going, it was near on impossible. And I had a lovely time. Well, when uh, when Louise Penton was on, she talks about a meet the midwife session, a meet the matron session. My friend just said that. I find it amazing. So you can go and talk through. Uh, um, the matron will talk through all of your notes. And kind of tell you Basically what happened. Different. Because, you know, when you're going through it, your mind's everywhere. And it yeah. doesn't matter if, you're, if your birth was six months ago, or six years ago, yeah. 16 years ago. They will go through your notes and talk you through it. And for Louise, she was like, for her, it just made her go, oh, it wasn't just yeah. me. It was, it was a difficult birth. Yeah. How do you how do you get that done? I, you mean, just I would have thought them. that all the midwives were like really busy, aren't they? Understand? I had about seven different midwives because I was in for so long, mm. but they have it all documented. But uh, my friend just had it done, and she said it was amazing. It really made her feel better yeah. about it, it happening mm. again. So you understand it. I I don't want to know what happened. Really? <laughs> yeah. It was. You know, I'm not having any more kids. So you know, I've got two. I feel very very blessed, but. Every time I had a child, I would have, um, not necessarily because of this, but I have MS and it would cause a relapse. So for me, I wouldn't have any more kids because um, I want to stay healthy for the two that I have. Yeah. So if, that's How was that finding out that you, had, that you have MS? All I thought about was my kids. When I found out, that was it. I cried myself to sleep for about three, four days, maybe longer, um, because... Our dad passed away from MS and all I knew was what it could do. You could be in a wheelchair, all this stuff. Because mine started with vision. I was so terrified I wouldn't see my kids get married. That's it. It was mm. those things that flash between, before your eyes and you're like, oh, my God, I might not be there for that. I might not see that. What happened? So it really made me reevaluate life completely and, and being a mum. Yeah. Changed so much, you know, eating healthy, living a healthier life. You know, actually, things that stress me out, getting rid of those, trying to yeah. eradicate as much stress as possible because that's a big tr trigger for MS anyway. But it really, really did change everything for the better. Yeah. For the better. Knowing something like that and having to own it made, it, made me better. I, I think anything like that makes you really... Just reevaluate, reevaluate yeah. the future, and yeah. I look forward a lot more than I ever used to. I mean, in yeah. terms Which is of funny. Your, in terms of your kids' diets and things, it's definitely yeah. made you a good parent in that respect. Yeah. because MS could start in the gut, right? Yeah, am I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, so it's you all, speak. I don't know. Yeah, you know, <laughs> most most diseases start in the gut right. like that. So um, it's all about keeping a clean gut and making sure my kids eat non-processed foods and that they take vitamin D every day. I didn't realise that was something that had to be done. No. So it has made me really look at my kids and say, okay, you're not getting this. Mm -hmm. I got it. You're not getting it. And even if and if they do, because you know you just don't know, it's. I'm beating it so you see it can be beaten. Because the thing with you know MS is it's not actually hereditary. Is it not? It's not well, It's not considered to be hereditary, although our dad has it. it, because not everyone gets it. So, right. so 
Our and dad had it. Do you, can you three have screenings or anything to see whether it's... Normally it comes up about when you're about 30, yeah, I think. Right. So we probably would have... Right. would have. But Im- Im- I, well, the kids I would the boys imagine, are only 30 now. I would imagine that it lives in all of us equally, but Nick would have got some kind of illness or something that triggered, triggered it in her. Right. Well, mine was childbirth. There you go. I know that because... Um, Oh, this is getting very technical. Technical, but um, if you think about your um, DNA and where it lives, it's like a cassette tape, and all of the two ends of the cassette tape can't ever be touched. But there's a little thread that goes through the middle, and when you are in stress or in trauma or whatever it is, your body has to grab something to help it through, and it grabs from that top of the cassette tape, so it will take away from that. Um, and that's where my MS happened to be. Right. Someone else's illness might not be in that. If you take things like vitamin D3, it coats that so it can't get through to it. So that's how, you know, it's just, it's all about basic DNA as well. But it, it, most diseases start in the gut. Um, so I just make sure my kids are extremely, extremely healthy. Mm. You know, they don't miss out on treats, but we don't really give them... Also, food. I guess you are setting them up. You know that you're setting them up to have a healthy... To enjoy those things yeah, later on yeah, in life. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. They do get the odd McDonald's um, because I wouldn't deprive them of things, but very rarely. Yeah. They have to have veg at least five, four to five times a week. Yeah. You know, I just like them to have good stuff. Yeah. Which I think most parents would want anyway, mm. you know. I usually start each episode of the podcast, this series anyway, with asking people about their childhoods. Yes. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to start there with you guys today <laughs> because I know it's not... It's hard, isn't it? Because I think I, I think of your family yeah. and I see how close you are and how what a tight-knit bond you've all got and it's all brilliant and beautiful and lovely. But the reality is that actually childhood for you guys, it wasn't that no. beautiful. It no. wasn't. No. We, we grew up in a domestic violence household. And mum and dad didn't actually split up until I was about 16. Yeah, I was um, 13. Yeah, so that would be right. Yeah. And not, and that wasn't because... Um, that was because mum was too frightened to go and we were all too frightened to go. Yeah. Um, she was fairly convinced that if she did, he would find us all and kill us all. And I think that we all believed that. Mm-hmm. Was well, he, well, he didn't, he, to... didn't he sort of say things to that effect? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And he tried yeah. to run us off the road and things it, like that when she, he'd see her in her car, he'd try and run it off the road and things and he kidnapped Jim. Yeah, but um, but mum was amazing, you know, and we learned so many incredible things from her. We were talking about this the other day about work ethic because our dad was a career criminal essentially, so he was always in and out of prison. And But mum would do whatever she had to do to feed us. She'd have, I remember her having like three jobs, dinner lady, cleaner, something else, working in a pub. She worked in cooking. Asda as well, didn't she? She worked in Asda and we would go along with her, watch her do it, you know, because she didn't have childcare either. She couldn't yeah. afford childcare. She was completely on her own and she'd do whatever she had to do to feed us. She she had zero kind of qualms about about whatever job it was. It just had to be done. So um, I think that we're really lucky in that respect. We got to see a lot of stuff that, although it wasn't always pretty, it did make us value a lot of stuff. Mm. Also made us extremely close. Mm. You know, we're not... It's funny because... Um, a lot of my friends with their siblings, they hug them and they kiss them and they cuddle them. You won't see that of us. Really? Yeah, we're not, not really. We're not really. The only time Sam and I hug is in a photo shoot and they're like, can you hug each other? <laughs> we're like, yeah, sure. Mm. Nice and stiff. Hey. Yeah, we're just, we're just <laughs> not that sort of family. But we look after each other and we have each other's backs more than I, you could even imagine. It's um, We are very, very, very close. And the love is more than showing affection mm. it's like yeah i got you whatever growing up in in that household mm. has it made you i guess a few things has it made you look at your mum differently now that you are parents in what she went through and how she pr- tried to protect you from it without a doubt she is selfless the which most i actually selfless find person. a bit annoying yeah <laughs> because you are allowed to have a life yeah. beyond your children yeah. you know you don't you're allowed to enjoy yourself you're allowed to buy yourself things my mum has to get permission from all of us yeah. still now really? to buy herself something it's bizarre yeah. like she, we saw this bracelet in london she was like yeah i really like it she'd been looking for this silver bracelet for ages i really like it but it's quite a lot of money and i was like don't buy it then mum 
get yourself a lovely funeral. <laughs> then she was like, oh, okay. You know, I mean, we're quite ruthless with each yeah. other like that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, you just, it's kind of hard to constantly say to her, mum, it's fine, go and yeah. do it, it's fine, it's fine, you are allowed now that we're all grown-ups. She was allowed back then, but, but the thing is she had nothing and she was so used to going without herself mm. to make sure that we were all fed. You know, like, I, I think particularly when the boys were young, she really had nothing. When, when I was born, Dad was in jail, so... And he, when she was, when he, before he went to jail, he sold her car and all of her possessions. I don't know why she stayed with him. And well, she I didn't, She was scared. Yeah, she, but she loved him as well. She's so loyal and loved him. And he, um, she had no heating, nothing. So luckily my uncle came round and would pick her up and would take her grocery shopping and buy it all for her, bought her firewood for the fire because she didn't have any heating. Just, she... Will always put us first because, you know, they're babies. yeah, they they what we're everything to her. But I remember like the boys um, never really asked for anything because they knew Mum had nothing. And one time, Jim I think said, uh, "I need a pair of trainers. I'd really like some Nike ones." Mum went, "Give me a goalers. I'll draw a tick on them." <laughs> that was it. You know, that's that's the kind of thing you got in our house. <laughs> Don't be so ridiculous. We were having this discussion because my son is hard work. Right. And I'm like, Mum, I just don't know what to do with him. I, I, you know, am I spoiling him too much? I just, he's just so much. And she went, the boys never ask for anything. I think, you know, she's like, mm-hmm. I think you spoil him too much. I'm like, well, you know, it's just so hard, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So that's why we were having the discussion about I it. I think the we? other thing is when you, when you grew up in that environment, there is the tendency to kind of overcompensate to make up for the fact that you didn't have that when you were a kid and so it's easy to do and you want them to have the things that you didn't have absolutely yeah. but it's really easy to ruin them a bit yeah really i feel easy. like i'm on the verge of that with my son but you know i think i think obviously i have the el- the eldest child of all of our of all of our kids so um you do go through a spell of watching yourself mess your kids you know you you can see you've just said something and you can you watch their little brains trigger and you think they're remembering that yeah they're literally that that's coming back up in a few years I know but now I'm at the stage with with my girls where I get to see all the hard work I've put in pay off yeah like um I sort of interviewed my daughter she's really into makeup she's 14 and I interviewed her about what she thought of the brands and you know and and one of the things that really came up was how much she cares about sustainability. And when I was 14, I didn't know what that was. I certainly wouldn't have cared about it. Mm. So I was really amazed. And also about diversity. Like, my daughter is, is, you know, a beautiful young white girl. Those things don't actually affect her in the same way that they might a beautiful black girl. But she really cares about it. She's Mm -hmm. like, this is something that has to happen. And the fact that she does is so empowering and amazing and I feel really proud of myself and and the world really that the kids are learning that yeah I'm really getting it and really caring about it she's like if if you're a brand and you're not doing that now you're not going to last no because you have to it's not like a thing that you that you um it's not a choice that is that's a given it's standard mm. yeah it's quite amazing and you to do a lot um, for uh, to raise awareness now for yeah. domestic abuse, yeah. um, and it's only really in the last few years that you've actually started talking about it. I find it really fascinating because you're kind of doing it twofold. You're kind of helping the mums that are in the situation now and realising that that's not fine, that's not okay to be treated in that way, but you're also giving them hope for their children. You know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, and, and actually watching the video that you guys made with your mum, yeah. she must be, be I, you could just feel the pride from both sides. Like, you obviously feel so proud of your mum for everything that she's given you and, and done for you, but she must feel so much pride looking at all four of you and kind of seeing the lives that you've made for yourselves. The interesting thing about that video was we wanted to start this chat thing and we said, look, let's start it off. She really didn't want to, did she? She, she didn't, want to, didn't do want to do it at all. We said, let's start it off with really laying ourselves out there mm. and telling people something about us that they don't know. So we asked mum and she was like, no, I don't want to do it. I was like, why not, mum? You're really going to help a lot of a lot of other women or men that are going through it. She said, because I'm, I'm ashamed. It's like, that's the whole reason you have to yeah. do it, mum. That is That there, what you've just said, is the reason you need to do this because so many other women will be ashamed and you can't be ashamed because it's not your fault. And, you know, she did it and was actually really 
pleased that she did it and felt, I think, a little bit of a release from it. Yeah, and it's once you've lived with that as a child, you have a connection to every other child that's ever lived with it. Yeah. Because only they will get that, what that's like to live in that situation. It's actually set us up really well. We're probably really good makeup artists because of it, because you can go into any room and you can sense an atmosphere. You can sense what a person needs from you because Mm -hmm. you're so used to going into a situation and thinking, you know, what's the best way for me to be so I don't get attacked How do I navigate this? What mood is dad in? It's exactly exactly that. So um, I get a lot of people email me that that come from that background that are Mm. like, yeah, it never leaves you. but And it doesn't. But I had counselling last year and it made such an incredible difference to revisit all that stuff and look at my coping mechanisms that have come out, oh, sorry, that have come out of um, of me. I spent all of my formative years watching my mum and dad's relationship and how I am in relationships is what I learned from that. Mm-hmm. So I've had to reprogram. Mm-hmm. Because I can't have a successful relationship if I'm constantly in comp- competition with, with a man and trying to break him so that it makes me feel powerful. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So it, yeah, it's been it. It's taken me until I'm forty really to finally feel like, oh, I get it. Mm-hmm. It is interesting because I chose a husband or we chose each other that is extremely loving in and we kiss in front of the kids and everything. We we make sure not that they, and everything not everything. <laughs> That would be very wrong. A whole different (laughs) scenario. But we make sure that they see love constantly. And, you know, I never, ever saw that. And I don't know whether that will make them better or not. I don't know if then they will go through life trying to find what mum and dad have. And they will never find, you know, they might not find that. I just know what I saw of my mum and dad wasn't right and when we would go to other people's houses and their fa- and their families got on I'd be like this is so weird around here your mum and dad like like each other I don't understand it um and I don't want my kids to ever have to witness that yeah. the other thing is kids will take something from f- they'll take something bad from whatever parenting experience yeah, you give exactly. them there will yeah. be something that screws mm-hmm. them up a little bit yeah we don't know what it is until they turn around and go you know mum you were away for my sports day or do you know what I mean we we can't possibly know but you also can't constantly think about it and blame yourself you just got to do the best you can do that's all we're and that's, and that's what we're all trying to do what every mum is trying to do mm. oh, and dad every parent is just trying hopefully trying to do the best for their children because you you know that's why you have them you want to and you just don't know what that's going to do whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing and i think that we breed so much competition with other parents and actually we should just be trying to support each other because it's bloody hard yeah none of us know whether we're doing it right or wrong we're just fighting to get through the day and to hope that we make the right choices like i don't my, i don't lie to my kids at all and sometimes they ask me really challenging questions and I have to not lie to them because, you know, they, I don't, my daughter, you know, when you go out and you're, you're at the, we were, I can't remember where we were, but she, she had to come in this toilet cubicle for me and I had my period. And I'm normally like, Edie, turn <laughs> look around, away, look away, look away, yeah. look away. And she, she turned round as I was pulling out my tampon <gasps> and she was like, what's that? What is that, mum? And I was like, Oh, God, I haven't even had time to think about my answer to this. <laughs> and I went, well, when mummies are mummies, sometimes they have a little bit of blood that comes from their bits. Yeah. Not all the time, just occasionally. She's like, oh, OK. She does it because I'm so open with her. Yeah. She didn't even, she wasn't scared, she wasn't bothered. She just went, OK. I was like, oh, my God, I hope I've answered that right. I don't know. I, But I, I've never lied to her so far. She knows she came out of my cut my scar in my belly and Harry came out of my bits. She's fine. They're, they're both fine. That's what they call it, bits. <laughs> the buzz told me the baby's coming out of my testicles the other day. Amazing. Like, You're so close. It's, so close. It's so funny because <laughs> they kept saying Kinda. to me, yeah. they kept saying to me, Mummy, how did I get out of you? Did you pull off your head and pop me out? <laughs> and I was like, no, you came out of my bits. And he was like, what? That must have hurt. I was like, it, it, it hurt a little bit, mate, a little bit. But, you know, they don't think anything of it. They know. They've never, I think if you try to lie to them, they don't know how he got in there. (laughs) 
I haven't even worked that, that bit out yet. But um, I was asked that. Oh. I said something about a seed. Daddy gave yeah. me a special seed. See, yeah, no that's idea. the one. Yeah. That's the one. When they, they've said things, and I say, when you love someone, well, how? Because now our nanny's pregnant. How did she get a baby in her? Do you just get an age and then it happens? I was like, did Daddy give her a seat too? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, not really. That's what you want. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> screamers around school. My, My daddy, daddy has a magic seat and he gives and he them to a lot of women. Nanny. <laughs> <laughs> but it's oh, you, who knows whether we're doing it wrong or right. One thing uh, that I have noticed that whenever you talk about your dad, usually you say um, our biological dad. Yes. yes. Because your stepdad Brian yeah. has obviously ha- he obviously has such a massive impact on all of your lives. Yeah. And the way that you talk about him with such love. Yeah. Is absolutely beautiful. What was it like when Brian came into your home? Because I think as a step parent as well, because I've got sort of, I've got, I, I would call Debbie my step mum, yeah. even though she came into the picture ten years ago when we were all adults. Um, what was it like seeing your mum in that loving relationship and having that positive force of energy? I don't. She doesn't show it. You know, she she really? was she was embarrassed to show affection and love. Um, I knew she could. I felt it from her, but. Um, yeah, I didn't. We didn't see it much, did we? No, and Brian was a bit more like a soulmate. You know, yeah. he was like a person that was always there that she could nag <laughs> quite a lot, and he'd just suck it up and yeah. do whatever she He's, needed him to do. Brian's passed away now, yeah. so um, you know, unfortunately, he was the most selfless, amazing man. But you could see that from yeah. the the way that it all aff- it affected all of you. Yeah. yeah. For that effect to come from a step parent just it goes to was... show how important that role is. Yeah. He, and even he... though you would have all been a lot older at that point as well. He 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 suffered a lot of brunt from us all. <laughs> no, he, he was the easiest person to pick on and torment. Yeah. <laughs> it was amazing, wasn't it, Nick? Yeah. Because Brian's so so caring that I'd get home from work and he'd be like. I can't do a Scottish accent, but um, he'd be like, all right, Nick, how was your day? I'd be like, really good, Brian. That's normally where people stop. But he can't do, he couldn't do silences <laughs> at all, right? And so he'd have to fill every <laughs> single silence, which would do, just do your brain in. So he'd say to me, what did you do? I worked, Brian. What did you have for lunch? I'd be like, oh, I had a tuna salad. <laughs> Was it nice? <laughs> yes, Brian. And this would go on. Almost like when your kids come back from school and you're just trying to get information out of them. <laughs> it would go on about the most mundane thing and, and for ages. So to make, to make myself not get wound up by it, because it would do my head in, I'd come in and I'd be like, all right, Brian, what are you up to? And I'd totally ask him all the same <laughs> questions. I'd be like, what have you done today? He'd be like, oh, I've been on the computer, I've done this. What did you eat? <laughs> you could see he'd be like, she's because he wouldn't know. He was probably like, she think, really cares. Yeah, he's really think, paying attention. She's so nice <laughs> yeah. to me. But I I learned to love that conversation. Yeah. Like it would happen every day, and I love same it. conversation. But he was so brilliant. Like we would all have um, we'd have like a takeaway together, wouldn't we? Yeah. We'd all sit around the table, and me, Nick, and Jim, and John would count how many times Brian chewed each bit of food because he would chew and chew and chew. Oh, no, he's not yeah. one of those 40, yes. 40 yes. chews. Yes. <laughs> it was 37 chews. No, everything. That's amazing. And, and I'd be like, because I'm me, <laughs> I'd be like, Brian, you chewed that 37 times before you swallowed it. He'd be like, mm. And he'd just <laughs> smile and carry he on. He would completely suck it up. We could be awful to him. We would have all finished, left the table, watching a film. He's still sitting there <laughs> eating his dinner. And we're like, we loved him. He was an amazing man. Yeah. And uh, we were very, very lucky to have him in our life for the time that we did. Because yeah. he made mum happy and he made us realise that men can be good. Because he was our first male role model, really, yeah. other than our dad, to realise that not all men are like that. Yeah. was a, a really lovely thing. Just goes to show that how important that role is and how special that role is. Absolutely. He was so brilliant that, like, on Mum and on Mum and Brian's second date, he met Jim and John. Oh, and really? How old, how old would Jim and John have been then? Eight or nine. But yeah. And he took them in his Vauxhall Vectra and um, they must have shaken up a bottle of Dr Pepper, which literally exploded <laughs> all over his car. And he was like, oh, don't worry, don't worry. He was so, was oh, amazing. don't worry, don't worry. Like, just laid back. It, and that he didn't have kids of his own to welcome this big tribe that we came with was 
quite a big deal yeah. and he never once moaned like no no fine. we would we whenever we went in there first thing you do when you get to mum's open the fridge see what's in there not because i de- desperately want to eat anything i just want to know if there's anything interesting in the fridge yeah it's like a homely thing isn't it <laughs> so we, but sometimes we would we just help ourselves with stuff and that's all food that brian's bought yeah you know like yeah he, he, was he had no problem with it yeah oh, so yeah he was amazing yeah um, back onto you two, yep. and and being a mum, and makeup. Yes, actually, because I think when whenever I give birth, I'm usually no makeup, hairs in a massive bun, and it goes back, I guess, to that thing of you feeling like you wanted to feel like you. Yeah. How, what do you do to kind of feel? What did you do to feel more like you after? In birth in terms of makeup like do you do you think like for women a bit of lipstick can help or is it just do you think it's really personal mm. i think even giving yourself time to do anything for yourself can really help just washing your hair just washing your having a bath oh my god yeah. those things that you literally can't do you're you're like oh do i baby's gone to sleep do i wash my hair or do i put the milk on get it ready or do I you know there's so much I think you have to have a bit of time for yourself yeah you know whether it's a lipstick whether it's going on a date night or something but I do think that you have to put something it's nice to you don't have to but I I do think it makes you feel back to your old self if you used to do a lot of you know you used to take time to do your makeup it's um being a mum doesn't have to define you completely no. as just a mum. I mean, Pixie Woo was born out of what you do to make yourself feel better when you're pregnant. Because I was eight months pregnant when I started it. Mm. And the first video I did was, um, it was a smoky eye for someone. But the second video I did was because it made me feel better about me. Yeah. And I continued to do it after my child was born because of that reason. If I didn't film it, I probably wouldn't have put the makeup on. Mm-hmm. So it gave me an opportunity to... to uh, feel like me again yeah and I also find it fascinating that both of you obviously beauty and makeup is a large part of what you do but both of you look really just gorgeous and quite simple in the way that you do makeup like it's not plastered on yeah it makes me feel quite sad yeah well, when I've... people are plastered you know, what's under that what are you trying yeah, to hide exactly I agree and I think that that's an aesthetic that's kind of grown on social media it particularly makes me sad when it's children yeah. of my daughter's age because because that's the time when you really don't need it yeah. quite often. Um, and makeup is often about identifying yourself or, you know, making yourself feel the best about who you are, not fitting into a kind of like, you know, this is Kim Kardashian's face. Yeah, it's expressing you. Absolutely. Rather than someone else. For I sure, because it's... you can go into a situation and just from the makeup or the hair or the clothes that someone has on, you can tell the kind of music they're into or, you know, the kind of person that they are. And that's that's great. That's how you find your tribe. But if if your look is all about this kind of creating perfection, which is not even a thing that exists, who who are you? Yeah. Who exactly are you? Because we're just copying. It's, it's like a face by numbers, mm. colour by numbers, isn't it? It's just a weird thing. I think um, and actually doing Pixie Woo has made me realise this. It's as important to love yourself without makeup as with makeup. Yeah. You know, I went through a stage where when I was younger where I wouldn't not wear makeup. Now I love not wearing makeup. And the fact that I enjoy not wearing it and I feel quite comfortable makes me love when I go out and I put it yeah. on and I'm like, ah... Now There's something I think quite liberating about it's, it. It's so powerful. It's it so is. incredibly powerful. I just sort of started, I use this term very loosely. I just started kind of dating this new guy. And um, I did a photo shoot yesterday and the makeup artist did such a beautiful job. It was mm-hmm. lovely. So I turned up at his house looking like amazing. And then <laughs> literally amazing. <laughs> I look amazing so good. Me. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then uh, within like, I don't know, 45 minutes, I was like, right, I'm going to take my makeup off now. So I just sat there and took my makeup off. I mean, he was in the room with me. I didn't do it in front of him kind of thing, but he was in there with me. And I just thought, I wonder if I would have done this X amount of years ago. But it certainly doesn't bother me to take my makeup off in front of someone because I I still feel just as valid yeah. without it as I feel with it. I think for me, Instagram stories is a massive part of that. I used yeah. to hate it. I yeah. used to hate it. Although you obviously start your videos with no makeup on and then build up, but I used to hate the idea of seeing some people see me raw. And yeah. then actually, it's so liberating going, well, this is me. This yeah. is actually me. 
And so it doesn't matter if you bump into me in the street. This is what you're going to get. I think that's exactly true. That. But don't you certainly... You, you get to a certain age where you stop caring what other people think. And that's the point yeah. where you feel completely liberated. Because I don't care. It doesn't matter anymore. You know, look, I've got this crazy dress on and these crazy boots on today. And you I, look beautiful. Well, thank you. But, you know, <laughs> Nick and I have now started living like sex in the city. Because if you buy all these clothes, yeah. you've got to wear them. What are you saving them for? Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so this, is, this is part of our new... Just not worry about what other people think. I went out into the street the other day in a floor-length yellow ball gown and Converse, Converse really? trainers. Yeah, wore it all day. Got so many comments. And I thought, well, wow, why don't I do this more often? So now I just do it every I've day. I've only started doing it because she does it and I'm really? always wearing a tracksuit next to her. And she's, people are like, wow, you look amazing. I'm like, oh, I really need to make some effort here. And, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I start all of my... Instagrams, I show myself training, red, yeah. raw, you know, it's... Do you think motherhood has kind of helped in that as well? Kind of that feeling like this is just me, I've got other the bigger things. I think and... it has, it's part and parcel, but I do think a lot of it is just getting to that age. Yeah. I also think it's um, responsibility that the people that follow you to show them that you don't have to be that way. You know, the reason I got into makeup was to... Um, to help people feel a bit better at that point. But I also think it's so important to show that you don't just have to be... Makeup isn't going to help you inside. Yeah, You know, it's going to make you feel better for a little while, but it's not. And I'm so important... I think it's so important to, especially when I do my Instagram stories, to not look like I've got tons of makeup on and perfect. You know, because that's not how I am. I mm. have blemishes and I look this way and I'm not embarrassed to show it. And hopefully that's going to attract the people that I want to follow me. Mm. The the real people that, you know, I'm not... You I know. think it's really important to show, like, imperfections. You know, we talk about Botox and things that we've had done, you know, because it's important for other people our age to, to know that the reality isn't that kind of yeah. filtered photo yeah. that they see pop up in their feed all the time. Do you think also having daughters, you feel I, like Yeah, I do. I yeah, feel definitely. massive sense. Yeah. yeah. I don't lie to my kids at all. Really? Like, I'm completely honest about all of that stuff. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, you know, Edie's really, really young, but she is so into makeup and stuff, and I don't know whether that's because I do it and she sees me do it, but she's, you know, she just loves it. And... I want her to be confident. She doesn't, she will just wear a little bit of lip gloss occasionally, but I don't really let her wear it leaving the house. But she just is, she just enjoys it. Yeah. You know, she just loves that, oh, that's pretty, mummy. I love that. When she sees it on me, oh, that's pretty. But she went through a stage where she would watch loads of drag makeup tutorials on, online. Really? I, they'd come up on my feed and she'd be like, that's amazing, mummy. He looks so pretty. He's a she, mummy. I'm like, yes, <laughs> darling. She loves it. And, and you know, to her, it's not makeup, it's creativity. Yeah, and I think that's how they oh, see it. Yeah. That's the thing. You know, I posted a picture of my daughter the other day and she looks very stunning and she has a red lipstick on and there's a few comments about her wearing a red lipstick. And it's like, you know what? You're making it sexual. Yeah. She isn't. Yeah. She's just wearing a red lipstick because she likes the colour red. Yeah. But you're seeing it as something, you know, something else. Yeah. So maybe don't. Yeah. Maybe you know? it's your maybe, problem. Maybe yeah, don't. not hers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that. Uh, so I end each episode with uh, you finishing uh, three sentences. Mm. It's very, it's easy. Don't panic. Okay. okay. Don't panic. Okay. Being a mum means always putting someone else first. Oh, it does. That's a good one. Go on, you'll go. Oh no. Oh. <laughs> Being a mum means. Um, Weirdly, it's given me a lot of freedom to be who I am. Mm. I don't know why, but when you said that, the first word that came to mind was freedom, even though in a lot of ways it isn't. It really is quite liberating. Yeah, and I totally see that. Weird, isn't it? The yeah. first word that came to my mind was freedom. Well, because I think it, it does that thing where it's don't sweat the small stuff. Exactly. It kind of lets you free of all that other stuff that's come before that's weighed you down. Absolutely. It also means you don't have that pressure of people saying, when are you going to have kids? No, but then you have one, then when are you going to have another one? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Never ending. I'm done, I'm done. That job's done. <laughs> um, uh, since having children, I... Have learnt to love myself more. I value my life a lot more. Because I want to stay healthy and fit for them. Nice. I like those. I'm happy when... I'm at home with my kids on our own. 
my happiest time, and this happened the other day, and I wanted to put music on in the background, you know, like in a movie like when, you, when there's the soundtrack <laughs> to it. My husband and my kids were sitting on the sofa and all l- belly laughing. That, in my mind, I was like, you can't get happier than this. Yeah, that's That's nice. my happiest moments. Those moments when I, when I feel like I'm a fly on the wall watching them Aww. just enjoy it and, yeah. and like, oh, when I'm not there, it's fine. They're still loving and laughing and, and whatnot. Obviously, I like being there, but <laughs> they're my most happiest moments. Yeah. That's lovely. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed it. We I loved, loved it. it. Loved Good. And all the best with everything. Thanks very much. Thank you. Last day of work. <laughs> last day, last day. <laughs> Who knows what will happen now? <laughs> oh, God. I that think we all know. Yeah, sorry, maybe, yeah. <laughs> that, that's exactly what will happen. <laughs> oh, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. <laughs> This podcast was brought to you by HelloFresh. HelloFresh deliver fuss-free recipes with all the fresh, pre-proportioned ingredients you need to cook them from scratch. With meals to cook in under 20 minutes, family favourites, vegetarian options and classics to choose from, enjoy great-tasting food designed to suit your lifestyle.